for those of you who just joined, thank you so much for being here. We're really excited to talk with you all. My name is Francesca, and I'm the chair of the NFA Performance Healthcare Committee. Um, I'm also a certified meditation instructor, and I've conducted research on the prevalence of performance-related injuries in collegiate music students and the stress connection. And I've created a website called playingwithoutpain.com as a method to connect musicians with resources to treat and prevent performance-related injuries and maintain good mental health. Um, I've also received two degrees in music myself, and I'm currently working in an administrative role with the Detroit Symphony. So uh, Steve, since you're next on my screen, would you like to introduce yourself? Okay, I'm Steve Mitchell. I'm an otolaryngologist, uh, currently down in Nashville, Tennessee, but after 20 years in the Navy, I moved around a little bit, and I uh, I can sort of play flute, although I stopped after the book two of Silver Burdett. Uh, but I married a flutist and got dragged into the NFA back in the 70s and have been with it ever since. Awesome. Thank you so much. And Chip, you're next on my screen. Would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, I'm um, a certified, board certified orthodontist. Um, and lifelong musician. I grew up in West Virginia, coal mining town where my interest in music um, didn't look like I was going to be able to make a living at it. So, uh, at, you know, I played a number of instruments growing up. I got my first flute as a freshman in dental school. And boy, I fell in love with it. And I've been playing flutes ever since. Um, so I've been on the Performance Healthcare uh, Committee Advisory Board for few decades now, along with Dr. Mitchell over there. So it's a pleasure to be here today. Awesome. Thank you so much. And Gabby, would you like to introduce yourself? Um, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Gabby Alvarado, and I'm a doctor in um, musical studies. Um, I play the flute um, with specialty in Baroque instruments. Um, I'm currently on the administrative side of music, working for the Sphinx organization, um, but as a flutist um, with uh, Ellis Lando syndrome and multiple other um, chronic illnesses, I have conducted study and um, written papers about having a disability and being a professional flutist. Great, thank you. And last but not least, Jackie. All right, um, so um, my doctorate's in exercise nutrition preventive health. So I'm a clinical exercise physiologist. I mainly work in patient care. So patients straight out of open heart surgery, um, advanced lung disease. Um, I did my postdoc in psychology and neuroscience and delivered a hypnosis intervention um, for an you know, NIH grant um, before becoming an anatomy physiology professor. So that's what I do for my day gig. Um, I did stop playing flute on my second, well, my, I managed to survive being a flute uh, or a music minor for one year, um, but it was too stressful for me. I had a lot of anxiety and stuff I had to manage. So I started meditating in, in my 20s and been to India a few times, went to school there for a minute. Um, so that's part of my background as well. But I came back to play in flute in 2018 because I think it's just such an important part of um, being human. And it's a really important thing that we need to be able to do and have minimal barriers to doing, especially for cognitive reserve and mental health and mental functioning. So these days I play with a community band. Occasionally I get a spot in the community orchestra. I take lessons. Um, I'm happy to be here. So thank you for having me. Thank you so much. So we're really excited to be here with you all. Welcome to everyone who just joined us. Um, at this point, I'd love to just open up the floor to questions. And if anyone has a burning question that they've been wanting to ask, uh, feel free to just unmute yourself or raise your hand and we can call on you. But yeah, this, this hour is kind of all about you guys and we want to be able to help support you in any way we can. So um, if anyone would like to start by asking a question, feel free. If not, I've got some general topics that I know are um, always popular and interesting that we can cover as well. I'd like to um, jump in. Sure, absolutely. Get to the deep end. <laughs> yeah, great. <laughs> um, the day after the National Flute Convention, I attended the convention in Chicago. 
and schlepped luggage and went to various workshops and so on. The day after my rotator cuff tore in my left shoulder and I had been treating the impingement for a couple of years. So I was always in pain, but it ended up being the rotator cuff, the, um, the a bone spur, a bunch of other things and the uh, bicep muscle. So I had surgery in November and I'm still recovering. And my question is, am I ever gonna play the flute again? I cannot even hold up a cup of tea. <laughs> Uh, a couple of things. The answer is yes. <laughs> um, so that, that, that's, that's right off the board is, is a yes. Um, it's going to take a while. Uh, the thing they never tell you uh, pre-op on shoulder surgery, it takes a long dadgum time to heal up from that. And uh, you will probably have four letter expletives about your, your physical therapist for quite a while until you finally get into it. I'm sorry, that's just part of it. Uh, mm -hmm. It does hurt. Now, will you have the exact same posture for playing the flute as you did before? I don't know, it, but, but it is possible to play the flute, even if you have to go so far as to have a transverse head joint. There are lots of different ways you can do it. So yes, you can play the flute. Will it be the same way? I don't know. It depends upon how well you recover, how much scar tissue you get, how hard you work on it. But can you play the flute? The answer is absolutely yes. Okay, thank you. Optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I would add to that, um, there are a number of ergonomic head joints uh, available. As a matter of fact, I'm beta, beta testing one for um, the New York Flute Club. Um, uh, what is she? She's the, well, she, she's on the board of the New York Flute Club as, as I am. And uh, she's de designed um, a variable head joint. It has three swivels so that will allow you to play the instrument from this direct, uh, position all the way down to completely uh, vertical where you're not stressing your shoulders at all. And if you want more information on that, write me at chip at chipshelton.com. Chip at chipshelton.com. And I'll, um, <clears throat> her name is Kathy Sanger. She's the inventor. It's, it's not on the market, but she does have some, um, she has some versions uh, that she has made already. And she'd be happy, I, I, my prediction is she'd be happy to have you beta test one. So I would uh, love to, because I, yeah. I've seen them, I've seen two versions of these alternative head joints. They're rather mm -hmm. pricey. So mm -hmm. um, I wanted to wait until after surgery and to see if I really am going to need to do that permanently. Mm -hmm. so, but I, I will send you a, an email. Thank you. Okay. Um, I was just going to say, for, I'm sorry about your injury. I know that can be real frustrating. I've um, dislocated both of my shoulders. Um, and I know from my own personal experience, like for me to be exactly where I was before in terms of strength and range of motion and everything, I mean, it took me three years. Mm -hmm. uh, of the and but that's like you know with yoga and like really pushing a lot you know but it took a long time but um but so I still have some occasional problems and one thing my teacher um suggested on one day where I was like having symptoms was really helpful um is just sometimes you have to use something else to hold the flute up for you I mean if you're at a place where you can't buy something you know finding ways to like use your environment to help you um, is good. Like I have a couch where I can sit all the way back. So it helps support my neck. Mm -hmm. And then I can have like a prop that I put the end of my flute on. So it's holding the flute up for me so that I'm not having to work as hard, but I'm still getting that practice in with my fingers and tone. I mean, because that may be, you know, where some of the focus has to be right now, just keeping your tone good and, and just, yeah, the tone has suffered. That's I, I'm an amateur flutist, first of all. So, and when I rehearse, I use the back of my chair as a prop. However, I use it as a prop for my other arm because I have lymphedema. So okay. I've, been tr I've been stressing the opposite arm all these years because I've been protecting the other arm, you know? So now I've got both of them. I have a backup saxophone and I think I'm headed maybe that way, but. <laughs> Actually, you would be a fantastic for the contrabass. Yeah, <laughs> it stands up, yeah. I'm only, I'm not even five feet tall though. Yeah. <laughs> That's all right. 
I've seen people play on step stools. I'm I'm around the same height as you, and I would definitely need one. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you, everyone, for your input on that. Um, are there any other questions from the audience? Feel free to unmute yourself or type in the chat, or you can message me directly if you'd prefer it to be anonymous. On the previous subject, I think flute maker Eva Kingma even has a uh, freestanding bass flute. Yeah. And there may be other manufacturers of freestanding bass flute, so you don't have to go as big as a contrabass and stand on a step stool. Yeah, I think I heard that. Eva Kingma, I think, makes one, and others do as well. Got that, Ola? Great. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, I'll um I'll get us uh get us going with another question here. So this these are kind of just commonly asked questions that we've heard a lot, and we know there's um a lot of interest around these topics. So I'll ask this to our panelists. What are some tips to continue playing the flute for aging flutists? that are facing mobility loss and other aging related challenges. Well, I'll pop in on this one because we've given some conferences on this at the NFA in the past. Um, probably, first of all, is recognize the fact that uh, uh, time rep really respects nobody. And so all of us will have some problems at some time and there'll be different kinds. And some of them may be related to the medications that you have to take for illnesses you're on. Some may have to do with mobility and flexibility. Uh, some may have to do with uh, loss of dentition due to not brushing or flossing as you should have when you're younger. Uh, there's a whole host of stuff. So uh, the first thing that I recommend to all my younger flutists is uh, Take care of yourself, because uh, there will become a time when you're going to pay the piper if you don't. And this has to do with uh, injuries, uh, not taking care of your diet, not taking care of your medications, not taking care of exercising, not taking care of your mental attitude and everything else. And so first of all is catch these people when they're young so they don't get into so much problems. Uh, secondly is do your regular health care checkups, and that includes uh, uh, even doing an online hearing test to make sure your hearing's not fizzling out on you, because uh, that can be a particular problem with uh, piccolo players in, in one ear. Um, and you want to find out beforehand before people start getting mad at you. Um, the other thing that has to go with is, is dryness. One of the big problems that happens with all of us as we get older is uh, the, moist, the glands that make the moisture start decreasing in effectiveness and in quantity. And this will cause a host of problems in terms of getting a dry mouth, particularly with wind players. Uh, it can also have a large problem with your teeth because your teeth will start to have more problems if they're not uh, moisturized as much. And unfortunately, virtually every medicine in the entire world will cause dryness as a side effect. Uh, very, very few don't. So no matter what condition you have, you're going to have to increase your water. You're going to have to time it so you don't have to take a potty break in the middle of your solo. Uh, and so there's a lots of little things you have to do to accommodate yourself, but yeah, start, start early, as early as best as you can. Great. Thank you so much. Anyone else want to chime in on that topic? I'll just add that, um, I personally, well, I, I, I've communicated with, with other people who have, and I have also, um, developed a, um, uh, I guess, an involuntary jaw movement um, when I'm playing the flute. And um, um, I've, I've developed a um, jaw stabilizer appliance that, that I'm beta testing. And I'm also doing some jaw strengthening exercises um, and which, which I already knew about uh, relative to advising patients and, and flutists about temporomandibular joint problems, TMJ. 
but mainly with TMJ, um, joint pain uh, relative to jaw movement. <clears throat> um, mo mostly you use stretching exercises, but only when, uh, when you're without pain. These exercises when you have pain. So jaw, ex jaw stretching exercises um, uh, are something that uh, is written up uh, very well. I've, I, I've actually written some things on it in Plutus Quarterly, um, and uh, you know that that can happen at any age, temporomandibular joint problems. But involuntary uh, jaw movements really can affect your flute sound, and um, so. Again, I'm I, working with a, a jaw stabilizer appliance. Uh, it, it helps a heck of a lot. And, and I'm really trying to build back some, some strength in the muscles as well. So that's, the report is still out on that, but I, I am making progress because just yesterday I, uh, I did a performance um, without my jaw stabilizer which works pretty darn good, but uh, I'm getting confident enough and enough uh, regain of control that my first, in about a year, my first performance uh, without the jaw stabilizer happened. So I'm doing these strengthening exercises three days a week, uh, three, three times a day, um, morning, whenever I get to it in the afternoon or early evening, and then, uh, when I'm practicing flute, which is usually late evening, uh, that's when I practice flute because it's a softer instrument than the saxophones and clarinets that I also play. Dr. Shelton, is that yeah. Yeah, is that appliance something that goes in your mouth or it goes in your mouth and it's uh, it holds your teeth uh, apart enough to get a good flute sound. But you're you're actually your upper and lower teeth are engaged into a soft material, um, so that uh, your jaw is discouraged from involuntary movements. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. Along that topic, we got um, a follow up question that says, "Can you address lung capacity for older players?" That actually going to go, go over a little bit to some of our exercise specialists in our team because uh, one of the problems is that again aging is a four letter word and uh, what will happen is you will have decreased mobility of your ribs you will have. Uh, a some people will start bending over more All, a lot of things will happen to cause you to have decreased lung capacity, which means again you need to work on it and you have to do a lot of. Blow bottle exercises, whatever it takes, uh, strengthening your muscles, uh, practicing taking a deep breath in and blowing out slowly. Uh, the vocalists have been doing this for years and the flutists are getting into it. Um, Jackie, that's kind of right down your neck of the woods, isn't it? Well, I was going to say, I mean, we just can't forget about good old aerobic exercise, you know, where we're exercising to the point that we're out of breath, you know, just think about when is the last time, like I was out of breath and I pushed myself so hard that I was out of breath, you know, and how many times a week can we do that? And um, you're going to lose lung mass every year. Everyone does. And the only way to protect from that and to help protect that tissue and to build more um, capacity is aerobic exercise is going to be the most powerful thing that we can do. You really need to get those pumps going, you know, and that's where we have to work with our own bodies and, and everyone can do something, you know, and cardiac rehab, we have the arm cranks where, you know, we can use the arms to help get that, um, heart rate up. There's a lot of like, um, exercises where we can sit in a chair, you know, a lot of things where we're bringing our hands above our heart is going to be really good to help um, get the pumps going. But then also very important if we can get up and walk as much as possible, take the stairs, you know, get a little uncomfortable, you know, that that's going to be really important. Um, and I mean, in terms of exercises for just like lung capacity, we did as kids, it was something as easy as using sandwich bags, you know, once the bags 
um, emptied out, if there's no holes in it, we would um, practice blowing the bag up all the way and then just, you know, see what you can do. If, if you can push it all the way, that's good. But if not, there needs to be some more exercise with that as well. If it gets really bad, some people need to actually have their doctor check them out uh, because we do have uh, several constricting lung diseases that can sneak up on you, especially if you have a family history of it. Uh, regardless of whether you've ever smoked before. And so sometimes a simple inhaler may be all you need to do. But again, because all inhalers make you dry, you get to time it as to when you do it and when you play. Yeah, the exercise induced asthma is normal uh, for a lot of people in the population as well. So you got to look at those ozone layer levels if you're outside and what the pollutants are. Right now, I just got a pollen alert here in town. So all of those things can make you uncomfortable too. One thing I like to really do um, is in my home is make it where my home, inside my house, I have a complete circuit that I can do. I don't have to go outside, but I can get my heart rate up. I'm um, I'm an anti-coffee table person. I, I really, we spend so much time in front of the TV. I really want to make sure there's nothing, there's no coffee table because then I can lay down and do leg lifts or just like really simple little things to just keep me moving. Um, I have a Bozzy ball, which is, I don't know if you've seen it, it's like a ball side up and a ball side down where you can flip it. I have that by my couch. So if I'm super feeling not motivated, I can just stand on it when I watch the news, but it makes me contract my muscles and it works on balance. Cause I think balance is another thing we really need to focus on for everyone getting older because it has such a significant effect on mortality and other risk factors. So um, keeping that mobility is, is important and balance is, is a big part of that. And then I have exercise equipment in my house too, where I can watch TV and make a deal with myself. It's like, okay, I'm going to watch TV, but I have to exercise for 30 minutes of this, or I have to go do scales. See, I do that too. The flute is part of the circuit. <laughs> um, so commercials sometimes also is like, there's my time to do scales. There's my time to do tone studies or play YouTube karaoke with whatever music I'm struggling with, you know. Um, yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. Fantastic information here. Um, so I received another question. Uh, how can you address pre-concert anxiety and or nervousness that could cause trembling to the lips or fingers? And I guess this could be both physical and also um, mental. There's many components to this question. Well, the, well the big trick is, first of all, not to jump right in and take a pill. Um, that, unfortunately, there's been a bit of that going around where everybody was jumping on and popping propranolol or endrol like it was uh, one-a-day vitamins, and that's not the right thing to do. Uh, first of all, most people, <laughs> most of the young people, one of the reasons they get pre-performance anxiety because they don't know their music well enough. And so they just need to practice it so they really have got it down cold. Um, but... Uh, some of the things that they were talking about in terms of relaxing yourself, knowing how to relax, how to meditate, how to lower your pulse rate, that'll probably be far more advantageous than anything that you can get from a drugstore. And so that's kind of the first thing to do. Also, making sure you don't go to Starbucks just before you give your performance, too, because trust me, you can get some real interesting jitters that way. Uh, and that's any caffeinated drink. And uh, including our RC cola and tea and everything else, unless it's herbal tea. So, again, look around for the things that are making you hyper stressed out, jittery, what have you, which can be anywhere from your mindset to what you're putting into your body uh, to what time of day it is uh, to what physical things you did beforehand. Um, one of the worst thing people do is they'll go out and mow the lawn before they go. Uh, give their little concert that night and they get the fine muscle tremors from the vibration from the lawnmower. I mean, the, the list is endless. And so it's just a matter of just picking it apart and finding out what you can do and talk to somebody, um, see what they have to say. Yeah. And I'll speak a little bit more about the mindset aspect of it, because this is something that I've been working on myself a lot. I found that um, with performance anxiety, a lot of it is rooted on based on what we think people's reactions might be to our performance if we make a mistake or if it doesn't go the way that we hope it will. Um, a lot of that comes from the speculation that people in the audience might be judgmental um, and things like that. So I've found something really helpful for me has been 
um, how I talk to myself while I practice. So there's negative self-talk and there's positive self-talk. And then in the middle, there's neutral self-talk. So that's mostly what I aim for if I find that I'm being really critical of myself in the practice room, instead of trying to just reverse it completely and go to positive self-talk, because that's really not that simple to do when you're in that really negative mindset. Um, I try and just neutralize things as best as I can and just listen to myself practice objectively. And if I make a mistake, I'll just kind of label it and say, okay, this is a mistake. Maybe get a little curious, say, what can I learn from this? Or um, all right, like this could be a learning opportunity uh, to figure out like what I can practice next in, in the practice room. And I think just little by little changing your mindset like that helps to build confidence over time. And for me, that's really helped a lot. Just changing the way that I talk to myself, which is, can be a long process. Um, I call it, uh, sorry, um, on what everyone was talking about, uh, you, something that we all struggle with also is that we don't get to perform as often to actually develop the skill of performing, right? So something that I used to recommend to a lot of my students um, and that I learned at a really early age was to practice performing in front of people. And this could be just like if you're in the practice room and somebody's like walking by, just ask them to listen to you or, you know, have your parents, your spouse, your siblings sit on um, the living room and then play for them. The more you allow yourself to go through the process of practicing and the performance, then the more ready you're going to be for that moment because you can simulate a lot of what could happen. Um, I mean, when I was um, preparing for auditions, I would do, I would try to like um, simulate what would happen in my body. So for me, it was more as, um, the adrenaline would um, affect my heart and like um, there are other stuff that have to do specifically with like my medical condition but um just like making yourself go through that process right so you could like maybe like jump up and down a few times and then try and play and then see how much of that would um actually translate to it right because a lot of it is going to happen um on stage but if you're proactive enough times outside of that very um pressure moment uh, under pressure moment then you'll feel more confident to know how to react to those things that happen to your body um also like one last thing i put um a link on the on uh, the chat um i um have had to um stop playing multiple times due to um the medical condition i have which affects my um joints and ligaments um and they constantly um dislocate and that goes not only from like my shoulders and um in larger extremity but also fingers um ribs etc so um one of the things that i have um found super useful has been that pedaler because you can just like put it on your desk and then like do it while you're like especially now that we're nowadays that we're in so many zoom meetings just like you know pump your arms you're, you're strengthening your arms in a uh with a lower impact which is what's gonna help you the most when you're recovering all that i would like definitely discuss this with your physical therapist after your surgery or like if you're on physical therapy right now um most physical therapists are very good at um giving you exercises um with like, so, sorry, low impact exercises that are actually gonna um, help you strengthen your muscles. Um, it might take you a lot longer than uh, like if you do a hit, a kind of um, exercise um, routine, but they'll also last longer um, after, you know, you recover from your surgery. But um, I'll definitely recommend this really cheap. There's some from like $4 and on, um, and and you can use it for um, your feet also and for your hands, and then you can basically exercise just like sitting mm -hmm. on your chair. Um, uh, thank you. I I wanted to comment on the anxiety part because as an amateur, I, I started learning to play flute as an adult. So I never had an aspiration to become professional, although I have played for money and I have played in uh, solo parts and things from time to time. I'm not really that good, but anyway, I play with uh, music groups whose, whose position is it's more important to get together and play than to worry about being perfect. 
So we get together monthly or bi-monthly or weekly or whatever when, when I can play. I'm not doing that right now. But we often have educators and we often have professional musicians sit in with us because they say it's there's just no stress. I can come and play. I can make mistakes. And I've found over the years, I've gotten a lot better because I'm not worried about you know, that only that single performance that will end my career or whatever. So I just put that out there because I, I do promote, I'm sort of a um, ombudsman for this. And I do promote people that it's more important to just play than to be perfect. And so I, I welcome your comments on that. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing that. I, I love that. And I myself have been trying to get more involved with community groups as well, just because like you said, there's just a lower amount of pressure and it's more comfortable to just play and, and feel like yourself. Um, and perfectionism is a huge topic that I personally would like to see addressed much more in the music education fields and just in the music industry in general. Um, so if anyone from the panel wants to comment on anything that's just been said, feel free. Well, I just I just wanted to make a couple of notes about the difference between generalized anxiety, which some some individual may have and they're diagnosed with that condition and they're managing it day to day versus um, performance associated anxiety, which may be different and or somebody may have a combination of the two. So I think maybe the approach for the, for those might be different. I real I really agree with Dr. Mitchell when he mentioned that you know sometimes people are they're anxious because they're they may not be as prepared. You know I tell my anatomy physiology students that you know they're like oh I have test anxiety. I'm like well anxiety in general you know is increased when we can't predict an outcome. And so I'm like, well, so if you haven't put the time in the eight hours a week you have to study to be successful, then it's going to be you're going to be less likely to predict the outcome, and that's going to increase anxiety. That's that's normal. So going back to what Ola was saying, I mean, we have two different groups. Maybe we're speaking to people who are amateurs, and it's not a career killer if you miss a note, and someone who is trying to get a a very narrow range of jobs and tenure track positions on a symphony and an orchestra, but it, where it really can make a huge difference, you know? So um, I'd like to acknowledge, you know, where there's different, it means different things to different people. So um, if, if it's going to be increased, we can't predict an outcome, right? So what does that mean to you and how can you take control? That's my question. When I go into a performance recently, I got asked to sub in for the very first time. I was like, yay, I feel like I leveled up for a second, but um, I was a little ill-prepared for sure. I bit off more than I could chew and I knew it. So I was like, what can I do to help this? And for me, it meant taking control of, of taking photocopies of my, my music on non-white paper. Another thing with aging artists, I mean, we have maybe a little more trouble with depth. I need my music to stand out to me more. Little pencil markings aren't going to work for me. And so I had to take a highlighter and highlight all those accidentals, high highlight the key changes. I, I needed to do whatever I could so that I felt like I was owning part of that experience more. I was taking control. I had something that I could use that I knew would decrease my error rate. And it did. And I'm really thankful for that. Yay. Um, another thing that can happen if you already have anxiety and then you have performance too, yay, we're doing double duty, then, you know, is the caffeine going to help or not? Is, I mean, you know, it, sometimes people like to be a little activated. They like, they, they thrive off the stress. And then other times you're trembling. You really have to have that insight to know who you are so that you respond appropriately. For me, yeah, I'll get a, like a little jacked up, maybe get a little shaky. So for me, you know, doing real slow practice is really important to like stabilize going into that concert where I'm not practicing at tempo. And I think that, that that's been a really beneficial um, advice that I've gotten recently, you know, from other, from professional musicians right you know we hear if you can't play it slow you can't play it fast and I think maybe slowing things down before performance might be really beneficial um, for a lot of people if they have that anxiety. Jackie I'm so glad you mentioned about color coding and and marking music up I have always done that because I'm coming at this much later obviously and my music literally looks like a Disney production I mean it's there's lines all over and colors. And in the beginning, I used to think I'm cheating somehow, that I shouldn't be doing this and I have to learn not to do it. And then I embraced it. So, you know. 
I recently showed a, a conductor my my music, how I'd color coded it, and I was trying to explain how I did it and everything. And he was like, oh, that made me nervous. Like immediately, like, oh no, that's not for me, you know? Um, so so I get that, but I I know what I need to be able to see what I need to see. And then also um for me, I can because I don't have a degree in music, you know. So I, when people have degrees in music, you understand the theory behind it, you understand the history and all these things. So when you're an amateur and you're coming in afterwards, or you haven't gotten that education. I mean, some of those patterns and stuff are a little harder to decipher. So um, color coding for me allows me to see that picture a lot clearer. Um, and then I recognize, oh, well, if there's an accidental, I'm more likely to make a mistake before or after it for example, but I didn't know that until I really went through and teased out where am I making mistakes. And that's another thing that can help an individual in prepping and reducing that anxiety is if you're in rehearsal and you're making mistakes, you need to have a way to write that down now. Where is this happening? Why is this happening? So that you, when you go to efficient practice, right, efficient practice where you're really going into those trouble spots, um, and that you're taking control of that, so that you're not just spinning your wheels and trying to practice everything which I think increases anxiety because then you have too much to do, right? You're trying to do everything at once, but you're not focused on what's the problem. Well, probably a, a spinoff on that that you pointed out very clearly is that um, you may actually need to take your music and to uh, make a photocopy of it with the contrast higher between dark and white. You may need to make it larger uh, and you also need to carry around some music stand, LED music stand lights with you, uh, especially as you get older, because our eyes really can't pull it out as much, and sometimes uh, the lighting is pretty abysmal. And so anything you can do to help you in that regard will make it easier rather than getting to a total tizzy and panic saying, oh my gosh, I don't know what this next note is because I can't see it because it's got 14 ledger lines underneath it. Well... <laughs> Great, thank you so much. Really wonderful discussions. Um, is there anyone else that would like to ask a question? Again, um, you can feel free to message me directly if you want it to be asked anonymously, type it in the chat or unmute yourself. Um, hi, can you, hi. I'm Beth Devlin. Um, Beth? Yep, Beth. Hi. <laughs> My question has to do with, um, you know, during COVID, I, I was t I was diagnosed and treated with endometrial cancer, and mm. you know, and then I I had a hernia, but and I still have a hernia, but now it's in a different spot, and I was wondering, like, what. You know, like what thoughts do you have for trying to improve? I'll say that core. I know aerobics, but I'm not an aerobics girl. Uh, getting like to improve the core, you know, from uh, like a, you know, like are there some exercises like in a like in a sitting position that would really help to improve uh, the core? Um, you know, I personally got really run down. I mean, it, it took a while for me to really even be able to walk across the floor, much less go up some stairs, um, you know, but I do think even as we get older, you know, it, even though aerobics are ideal, if, if we haven't been doing them, we can't get to aerobics until we can maybe do some other things. So I, hopefully that question makes sense. Uh, I'm gonna speak um, about it as a as a patient that went back to playing the flute. Um, I I think um, we have to make sure that we address. I think aerobics are more for your your heart to get to a certain um, speed per minute that you can't 
that can also help with your breathing. So I think like when you're talking about aerobics, like let's make sure that we know how they're gonna help us as that two player. Um, I would say if you're having problems with your core, the number one thing that I always recommend to anyone and like for me, basically like save me um, and let me play standing again because for a really long time I was bit ridden and like could not stand for more than three minutes at the time. Um, <clears throat> it's actually Pilates because Pilates as, as you know, their, their main thing is they work from strengthening the core to um, help the rest of the extremities in the body to learn how to move. So um, I would say that to me helped me not only in like in my day to day or like doing things like sitting and standing from a chair and like um, showering, getting into the shower, et cetera, but also um, into playing because you have to really develop this strength on your lower abdominals that is like basically, you know, how you're gonna go back into um, strengthening your playing. Um, so um, I'm sorry that you had to, I know endometriosis is like really painful and I'm really sorry you had to go through that. Um, but I will say there is a lot of hope there. Um, and there are um, a lot of, doctors in the performing arts health field that are helping uh, musicians and just artists in general um, to go back into, uh, oh, get back into shape, but starting with the right kind of exercise. So you're right, Beth, I wouldn't go straight into aerobics because you probably would not be able to, um, but it should be more um, about, strengthening your core. Um, I teach the muscles, like my students have to learn them and they're tested on them, so it's a little different. So one thing that I find, um, you know, with students, we need to find, identify our muscles, right? I think that that's kind of part of the hard part too, sometimes just like find it. Um, so one thing that I'm always telling my students in, in terms of that core, because a lot of my students want to be healthcare providers and one of the number one injuries to healthcare providers or back injuries. So it's always about protecting them and protecting the students and learning good body mechanics. But one thing that I tell them, you know, to just make it kind of habitual is like if you're driving a car and you're at a stop sign, engage your abdominals. You're driving a car, you hit a red light, engage your abdominals. Like how many times do you ask yourself throughout the day, where's my core? Am I strong? You know, you have a spine, you're not an amoeba, use it, you know, like, are you supporting yourself? You know, and it's just those little like, like moments of just checking in with yourself. It's like, did you see, where's my posture right now? Am I thinking, you know, world is hard Can I expand up, you know, open up those lungs, open up those shoulders, engage the abdominals. You know, it doesn't have to be something that's so hard and a lot of work because I also say hey you got rid of the coffee table you're watching tv lay on the floor let's time let's work on our abs let's do some ab work let's do some leg work you know find those little bitty spaces of time um where you just check in so even if it's like you know kind of a goal like I'm gonna make sure I check in with myself once a day four days a week and then keep you know toggle the numbers where you're checking in more and more to where even right now she mentioned abs I said where are my abdominals am I engaged am I am I breathing freely am I standing up am I sitting up straight like those those are these are opportunities all the time that are just there for us if I can add to that um I'm a scuba diver and and water sports has always been my biggest thing Two weeks ago, my surgeon finally allowed me to go back to the pool. I do water aerobics, and that is all core. It is the best. Nothing hurts in the water, and I really recommend that. I really do. Great. Thanks for sharing. Um, if there are any other questions feel free to unmute yourself. But in the meantime, I'll jump in and ask one because I know this is a topic we've discussed for years on this committee and also just um, like with flutists in general. So what are some things to watch out for with students who have recently gotten braces? And I wanted to add on to that question because I do have a student that recently got braces. How can you tell if um, there is a warning sign of the pain they're experiencing, or if it's just discomfort from them getting used to playing with braces, I guess, like what, what would be like the red flags to kind of watch out for 
of pain symptoms that students are experiencing after just getting braces? Well, um, I got braces for the first time as a practicing orthodontist. I was, I was two or three years into my own practice and I was also a jazz recording artist by that point. And um, uh, I was appalled and surprised how much discomfort the braces caused initially. Um, I learned a lot about how to talk to my patients just going through it myself. <clears throat> uh, fortunately, uh, the, the, the wax that you can put, uh, just you know, stick it to the braces and that smooths out the braces and the wires. <clears throat> that works really well. So um, that's, that's step number one. And the, the um, especially when you're trying to play the flute. And by the way, I didn't give up flute playing. I, I probably took a few days off, but uh, with the uh, with the wax on on the braces, while I was you know still in the getting used to the uh, this, the uh, presence of them, um, it really helped me to continue to practice and play flute. Um, so the other thing was um, I I was in on the uh, when Invisalign first uh, came on into the market. And um, so I really, uh, unlike many of my colleagues, I really uh, got into the Invisalign technique and became a, a preferred, preferred provider and award-winning provider in Invisalign because I, <clears throat> I mastered that technique in order to move teeth and um, uh, with that, you could you could practice with the removable aligners in, or you could take them out um, and practice. Um, I, you know, nowadays you have mail order orthodontics simulated Invisalign. Um, I I don't recommend it. Um, it may be getting more um, closer to the care that you get with a with a you know a real practitioner uh, seeing regularly, but I, I wouldn't recommend that at all personally, and and just based on the feedback I've gotten uh, over the last decade. Um, so, lingual braces, where you know I've had patients who actually you know they couldn't before Invisalign they couldn't they acting and modeling careers, et cetera, they, and musical careers. They, they couldn't get regular braces, so I was doing lingual braces. Um, so that's a different area of discomfort, but uh, they, the thing to look out for there is, yeah, definitely use the wax, but um, don't accept any playing or speaking or acting engagements for the first three or four weeks. Uh, because you're going to down like this a little bit at first and there's you know you you you, um, you actually get used to them quicker than than one would think especially if you do some uh, you know exercises uh, just uh, maybe counting uh, one to a hundred in four three three or four languages <laughs> um if yeah anyway um so I guess that's all I want to share about braces. Um, I, oh, there's an NFA, National Flute Association article that I and two other um, people uh, on, on the panel um, who experienced orthodontics. Uh, we, it was two years ago. You can look at the, in the archives of the, uh, Flutus Quarterly, and we wrote a, an in-depth article about uh, braces and, and flute playing. I think I have that article. Um, yeah. I'm going to see if I can send it to the chat. 
Because that was that was a fantastic article outlining everything that you just said. And thank you so much for sharing your experience as well. That was really helpful. So I'll see if I can find that and I'll send it to the chat. Thank you. Um, awesome. I think we might have time for one or two more questions if anyone would like to ask anything. And I'll look for that article in the meantime. Feel free to unmute yourself if you'd like. One thing for everybody to recognize is that the Flutus Quarterly has a vast storehouse of information. So any of the questions you have anywhere along the line, by all means, go search through the search index on it because whatever you're thinking of, you're having a problem with, I can guarantee you somebody in the past couple of decades has had the same questions and problems and has already been written up and there's an article already about it. Yeah, absolutely. And we have more coming too. We have two articles from our committee that will be published in the spring issue and more to come in the future. Um, so I guess I can ask one more question if there's none others before we wrap up. But I also wanted to point you towards our webpage on nfaonline.org. So we have a new feature on our webpage and it's a question submission box. So we want to be available to you as a resource um, 365 days a year, not just on the days that we have these Q&A sessions um, or during the conference. So if you ever have a question for the committee, feel free to just use that submission box on our website, the form, and fill out your question, and we'll send it to um, the committee and we will I'll get back to you with a response and it can be anonymous if you'd wish um, and if you submit an anonymous question we'll just keep it in a collection and we will draw from it to write future articles um, blog posts and resources that we make available to the committee um, were there any final questions Okay, so I'll, I'll ask a final question. Um, I guess, what is one piece of advice that you would give to someone who has recently gotten diagnosed with a performance-related injury um, of any kind? I've personally been through it. I've also had to take time off of playing um, for a shoulder injury that got pretty severe. So I know personally how scary and isolating that experience can feel, and it's just really stigmatized, unfortunately. In our industry, it's um, not a comfortable thing for people to talk about, and it's also scary if if your career depends on your ability to perform. So um, I guess if any of the panelists would just like to comment on either personal experiences or pieces of advice that you would give to someone who just received a diagnosis like that. Well, the biggest thing is, is that you are the only person who knows your body, number one. Number two, I can guarantee that 99.9% .9 of the time, whoever is treating you has the foggiest idea what you're going through, what your problems are, what your requirements are, what your issues are, and what problems are going to affect you, which means I, I, I rest my case with the water. Um, a lot of people don't recognize how absolutely critical it is that you don't lose your moisture in your mouth and they throw medicines at you and say, oh, here, take this. And next thing you know, you got the Sahara Desert and it's between your lips. Uh, so you're going to have to become very, very knowledgeable. Uh, you may not want to know about medicine. You may not want to know about pills. You may not want to know about the anatomy of your shoulder and your fingers. Tough beans. You're going to have to know it because the person who's treating you probably won't. And they may do you more harm than good. And we've had, it doesn't affect flutus too much, but we had a big problem a long time ago with women who are going uh, with having problems with endometriosis. And the gynecologists are treating these singers, professional singers, with Danazol. And what that does is that permanently knocks out your top five notes. Period. Gone. For good. Never come back. Which means their, their career was over from that standpoint. Uh, so they didn't know. You know, they weren't being malicious, but they had no idea. Uh, which means you are going to have to be responsible for it. It means you're going to have to contact us, contact a textbook, uh, be very wary about online because uh, about 10% of the stuff you see online you can trust. 
uh, there's a lot of garbage out there. And so you have to be very, very cautious about that. And there are a lot of people who want to sell you something. So you can be very cautious about that too. But you're going to be very responsible um, about anything that goes in your mouth. Before you put any pill in, know what it is. And make sure you educate your doctor. If you've got a family doctor who's kind of knows, is at least caring, educate them. Let them know. Bring your flute with you into the exam room. I mean, we had to do this for um, our flutists who were getting hearing aids. They had to literally bring their flute with them into the audio booth because the hearing aid specialists had no idea that those high frequencies were going to make their ears just go kind of bonkers. And they had to really tune them in accordingly. So, yeah, just be responsible. That's great. Thank you so much. Can I say a couple of things, too? I've been through multiple um, health issues, breast cancer twice, lots of chemo, which destroyed my voice for singing. So I can only sing through my flute or other instruments. But my my doctors um, are um, they're specialists in sports medicine. And so I propose to them, I am an athlete. And you need to see musicians as athletes. So I kind of opened the eyes of a few of them who hadn't been. Now I, I can see the wheels turning. Wow, I have a whole different kind of practice I can do. So, um, but I... I think the, the original question was what to do, you know, when you have these situations. And all the times I've had to quit playing the flute, I never gave up on it. And uh, I remember Ian Anderson from Jethro Tull once said that what motivated him was he'd keep a kitchen flute. So he'd always have a flute out in the kitchen. So he says, if I'm wandering through the kitchen, I'll pick it up and play. And I think a lot of times we put, we clean our flutes and put them away and then we don't see them. So I have um, one of those Nouveau plastic flutes that I can keep out all the time. It doesn't tarnish. And so whenever I'm walking by, I can pick it up and play a little bit. And that keeps me motivated. And it's also very light. So when I can lift my arm up a little more, it won't be so heavy. So I just, I just, refuse to give up. And I, like I said, I'm not very good, but I'm going to be good enough to, you know, play with the groups I play with and enjoy it myself. So. Thank you so much for sharing. Those Nouveau flutes have really good sound too. I've tried them. They're surprisingly good. <laughs> yeah. I've considered buying one myself too. I was just going to say, you know, that um, there is definitely a push to approach musicians as small muscle athletes, um, as opposed to our large muscle athletes that we think about normally. Um, and that push is in Performing Arts Medical Association. The American College of Sports Net Medicine is now like teamed up with them in terms of classes and certification classes type available for people to take and become more educated on the subject. Um, but you're right, we are athletes, small muscle athletes, and that's where those repetitive use injuries and kind of going back to what you're saying, um, Dr. Mitchell, you know, if someone gets injured, you got to say something because all that accumulation over time, it will affect you when you're an older player. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a lot easier to fix things before they get worse than to get to the point that you're now having to manage the choices you made two decades ago. Um, so that self-awareness that Dr. Mitchell was talking about, I feel like it's so mm -hmm. crucial you know, and let us help you as far as this committee and stuff with understanding maybe some of the physiology behind things, you know, I recognize a lot of people don't have those backgrounds and those different effects and, and whatnot and mm -hmm. help turn you into resources that are out there that are peer reviewed and legitimate, you know, um, but we're yeah, athletes. I, I did take my flute to the physical therapist and I took it to the doctor and I said, it doesn't seem real heavy, does it? You know, it's like 15 ounces. I said, now stand like this for two hours and hold it <laughs> and see how heavy it is. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you, Jackie. Any other panelists want to chime in on this before we close? Um, I was going to say, just know that you're going to have to be your best advocate because as Dr. Mitchell was saying, nobody's going to know better, but also, um, I know from having three degrees at the conservatory, you will find a lot of musicians, classical musicians, who will make you play through pain. And um, that makes it really bad pretty fast. Um, if 
somebody doesn't listen, go and talk to someone else, read. I know um, Dr. Misha was like taking us from <clears throat> um, reading online, but there are like the Mayo Clinic has, you know, in, um, incredible resources and Texas Health also has incredible resources. So go to, um, if you can't go see the doctor right away, um, uh, contact us, but also um, go to the medical resources that are free and out there for, for everyone. And since the question was specifically for injuries, um, I know um, just from experience and like reading a lot and researching, um, the first thing that most um, physicians would tell you to do is to stop moving, but actually your muscles become um, weaker way faster if you don't move. Um, I know that the repetitive movement that we do as a, a flute player um, is very specific, but there are other movements that you can start um, incorporating to your routine that will help you heal and not um, decondition so fast. That's great. Thank you, Gabby. Um, I'll also chime in. I know that just from personal experience, um, talking about it can be really helpful as well, especially when I was first going through my initial um, round of my shoulder injury, which has has had several flare-ups ever since. I didn't know of anyone that had been injured by playing an instrument. I didn't think it was possible. I really truly felt like there was something wrong with me because I was experiencing this pain. So it was like, it felt very, very isolating, but I eventually found a bunch of other musicians who had been through the same thing and just had never really spoken about it. So if anyone would ever just like to talk about it, um, I'm always willing to talk to people about their experiences. I think it's really important to just start the discussion and just know that you are not alone in this. And several studies have demonstrated that an extremely high percentage of musicians have suffered a performance related injury at some point throughout their careers. So you are certainly not alone and we're here to support you. Um, and yeah, if you ever just want to talk about it, I'll put my email in, in the chat. Feel free to just email me and, and we can chat. Um, Anyone else have anything before we wrap up? This is Beth again. Hi, Beth. Uh, I, I totally agree with every, what everyone's saying about you have to be your own advocate. Um, what I'm wondering is that as a committee, if you guys could come up with um, questions maybe that people should bring to their doctors, you know, like, like I wouldn't have thought to say, oh, okay, is this going to cause a permanent problem to say my vocal cords or, you know, yeah. and, and I get like you do your own research, but especially like when you injure yourself or you go through cancer or, or any of those other things, you're, you're already so overwhelmed that you, you know, maybe if you have that cheat sheet to kind of say, oh yeah, I want to ask about that at my doctor's appointment. Um, are there some I don't, I'll say general guidelines you guys might be able to think of or come up with as a cheat sheet to like put on the website to say, hey, if you're going through something, think about these things to ask your doctor. Yeah. You on there. Bring your flute. <laughs> I think I, I too brought my flute to things and my doctors were very um, supportive and, and they were great. Uh, but sometimes you just don't know. You don't know uh, sometimes what to ask. And if you're so overwhelmed, with all these other things that you don't even know how to say, okay, what's this chemo thing I'm going to do once yeah. a week or once every three weeks or, you know, um, having something maybe that we could take, you know, hopefully no one ever has to go again, but they will, I'm sure. Um, but having something might help people say, oh, what about this? The, you know, this, you know, I need to be able to have spit in my mouth <laughs> as crazy as that sounds or what, or anything, mm -hmm. you know? And I thank think that, you all, you guys, this has been a tremendous, I know I was a little late, but this has been a tremendous call. Oh, thank you so much. We're so happy to hear that. And yeah, I think that's a fantastic idea for an article that we can collaborate on in the future. So I'll make a note of that and we'll definitely get that on our to-do list as a committee. That's fantastic. Well, one simple thing to do is uh, write everything down before you go in. It's amazing how panicky you can get when you're in there, in the doctor's office, you only got a few minutes, they can tell they're in a hurry and your mind goes poof. So, you know, have your little shopping list. Some of them will roll their eyes and despair when they see you with your shopping list, but too, too bad. 
Um, have the list of the important things that you can read them, read them off one by one by one. And you may, if it's a long term thing, bring a notebook. Yeah, so it's always in one place and you have that notebook. Yeah, and even just writing down your symptoms is tremendously helpful in any capacity, just keeping track of, of what's going on. And I find that the new systems with the patient portals are really helpful if you have if you have that available. I know that um, that way I can let my doctors know in real time if I'm having specific symptoms. And then also, if you do come across an article where now all of a sudden you maybe have a question about your medication and how it's going to affect um, your playing, it's that you can shoot those documents straight to them. And then maybe if they don't have time to read it, maybe they can have some of their staff read it, you know, to just throw that out there. I do always like to have some kind of research to back what what I'm asking for at times. I, I mean, in terms of my own prep, you know, but that's a great way to keep that conversation ongoing and really let them know what your needs are. And if, if um, you feel like your treatment is affecting you negatively or positively too. You're muted, Francesca. Oh gosh, thank you. I was gonna say, great. Thank you so much. Any last minute comments from our panelists before we close out today? All right, well, I just personally like to thank all of our panelists so much for your incredible advice that you've given today and your expertise and your time for being here. And thank you to all of our attendees who took the time out of your Sunday to be with us and ask some really important questions. So we, we truly appreciate it. And please take advantage of our question submission form on, on the nfaonline.org webpage. We would love to hear from you. And thanks again for being here.